the problem turned out to be friction. Even at 800 kilometres, the satellites were still affected by the Earth's atmosphere. That made them slow down. So every year they fell about a kilometre closer to the Earth. To work out the temperature, they needed to take into account the height. So having the wrong height meant the temperature was wrong too. To make matters worse, the drag also affected the satellite's timing. Take a satellite which started off measuring the temperature at 2 in the afternoon. After a few years, it was measuring it at 6 in the evening. So it looked like the temperature had cooled when it hadn't. Once this was pointed out, even the scientists behind the original calculations admitted they were wrong. I think it is a little embarrassing for a scientist when someone shows that they're wrong on something. Uh, so yes, it is a little embarrassing when somebody finds an error in your data. Oh, I mean, you've got to feel for them. I mean, I'd be absolutely mortified if I had to admit a high-profile mistake like that. For me, the important thing is that Spencer admitted he'd made a mistake. When the error was pointed out to him, he read out his calculations and right enough, he came up with a rather different answer. I think when we made that correction, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think we went from a, a cooling trend to a slight warming trend. And then ever since then, it's been a warming trend, um, actually by sort of ever-increasing amounts. Now even die-hard skeptics had to accept that there had been warming in the second half of the 20th century. Yeah. When somebody says that there's no such thing as warming, I well, guess worm. Yes. Yeah. It's hard to look, look at all those records and entertain that. How can you argue with thermometers? Yeah. I don't argue with thermometers. The rising temperature was now a fact, with thermometers and satellites confirming it. The skeptics' challenge had actually made the case stronger. But the battle was far from over. The skeptics hit back with a crucial question. Was the warming man-made or natural? If it was natural, there was no reason to think it would continue, and nothing we could do about it in any case. And the skeptics said they had evidence that it was just natural variation. Because they said it had happened before. And the proof could be found in history. In 1000 AD, the Viking Eric the Red was banished from his native land for murder. He landed on this coast and made it his home. And he gave it a surprising name. Quite how this rather bleak landscape came to be known as Greenland is still debated. Some say it was a masterful piece of spin by Eric, designed to entice settlers to his new home. Others say that it may have been more truthful than it seems. They argue that back then, Greenland was warmer and more hospitable than it is today. A genuinely green and fertile land. What's certain is that he was able to survive here. On this now barren land, the Vikings grew crops and farmed cattle. This, said the skeptics, was proof that Greenland was warmer a thousand years ago. And this warmth was also felt closer to home. According to English historical records, the centuries around 1000 AD were warm and favourable. Harvests were good, the population grew and culture flourished. This was when Westminster Abbey and Salisbury Cathedral were built. And just like today, it was warm enough to grow grapes in England. Scientists gave this period a name, the Medieval Warm Period. To the skeptics, 
The medieval warm period showed that today's temperatures are not unusual. It just doesn't make sense if you know anything about climate history and how much warmer it was in Viking times, for example. And all the evidence shows that the medieval warming was a great deal warmer than it is today. So there's nothing unusual about the current warming. If the medieval warm period really was hotter than today, as the skeptics said, it would support the idea that global warming is just part of the climate's natural cycle. The historical evidence seemed to back up the claim. But what scientists needed was hard data. They needed to know what the temperature really was 1,000 years ago in the medieval warm period. In the 1990s, a scientist called Michael Mann took on the task. But he faced a major challenge. It's not easy. Uh, we have instrumental records uh, on a widespread global basis, um, really for only at, at most the past century. Um, then, maybe back into the mid-19th century, uh, enough instrumental data to say something, for example, about the average temperature of the northern hemisphere. But by the time you go farther back, there are very few instrumental records. With no thermometer records, Michael Mann needed something that could act like a natural thermometer. Something that would provide data going back centuries. And this is where he found it. I'm in the White Mountains in California. And this area is a real mecca for scientists studying past climate. That's because this is no ordinary forest. It's home to the oldest living things on the planet. These trees live for thousands of years. They're called bristlecone pines, and they're found only in a few small areas of the western USA. Oh, this is strangely wonderful. It feels as if it's oozing out everywhere. Ah, made you a bit surprised, considering how old it is, you'd think it was much bigger. I guess it shows its age in other ways. I mean, look at this weather-beaten and gnarled texture. I'm told that this one's about 2,000 years old, but some of the trees are over 4,000 years old. I mean, when they were saplings, my, my ancestors were living in straw huts. Stonehenge was modern architecture. It really stretches your mind. These were just what Michael Mann was looking for, because inside they contain a record of past temperatures. Like any tree, these pines lay down rings, one for each year of their life. These rings are the key to past climate. This is a slice from one of the trees. Take a look. You can barely see the tree rings. They're in there all right. They're just really tightly packed. And the reason that each ring is so fine is because the tree grows a tiny amount every year. That is a hundred years. And it's these rings that tell us about past temperatures because they tell us how much the tree grew in that year. In a warm year, the snows will melt earlier and the trees will grow more and leave a fatter ring. In a cold year, they'll hardly grow at all. It's called a climate proxy. You can't read temperature directly like reading it from a thermometer, but you can use the evidence to estimate what the temperature was. But of course, this only tells you about the conditions in this one place. So Michael Mann and his team needed to find other temperature proxies from all around the world. Places that could tell them what the temperature really was as far back as the medieval warm period. 